Today I want to talk to you out of John chapter 19, looking at the words of Jesus when he said, I'm thirsty. Those of you that have not been here the last couple weeks, Jesus died at 9, he was crucified at 9 a.m. Our time, it would be like this, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, six hours. He hung on the cross and he gave up his spirit at 3 p.m. John chapter 19, verse 28. Here we go. After this, Jesus knew that everything had been done. He accomplished his purpose. He's dying for the sins of humanity. He's coming to this last moment so that the scripture would come true. He said, I'm thirsty. So the scripture would come true. He said, I'm thirsty. What does I'm thirsty have to do with making the scripture come true. We're gonna look at that in a moment. There was a jar full of vinegar there. So the soldiers soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a branch of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus's mouth. It's interesting, when I was reading the Bible years ago, I coupled things, and for those of you maybe that have seen this or heard this, or maybe you've seen the movie, The Jesus of Nazareth, and, and you see guards, they're lifting up something, and they're, they're, they're putting this moment where they're putting, putting something to quench the thirst of Jesus to the lips of Jesus. There's actually two different points in the crucifixion where Jesus is offered something to drink. Now, I coupled the two for years. And then I realized one day, time out, hold on. In the beginning of the crucifixion, he was offered something to drink and he refused. Right at the end of the crucifixion, he's offered something to drink and he accepts. What's the difference of the scenario when he refused versus when he accepted? We're studying today at the end when he accepted. But why did he refuse? Mark chapter 15, the very beginning of the crucifixion. This is important. Two different times he's offered. One he refuses, one he accepts. Mark chapter 15, verse 23. Here's the one in the beginning he refuses. He's, he's crucified. I mean, literally, they raise up the cross and the soldiers, watch what they do. The soldiers tried to give Jesus wine mixed with myrrh to drink. But he refused. This is the beginning of the crucifixion. Question, why did Jesus in the beginning refuse and at the end of the crucifixion he accepted? What, what, what was the difference? Well, it's interesting. The Bible says that he refused. There was, it was wine mixed with myrrh. Do you guys remember the classic story that we all love to hear about. Matter of fact, there's school plays about this. I was in the school plays of the, the tale of the, the three kings and, you know, the kings that came to Jesus at the manger. And, and what did they bring? Here's what they brought. Here's what they brought. They brought, come on, say it, gold and frankincense and what? Myrrh. What is myrrh? Myrrh is a resin. It comes off of a plant in Bible times. And myrrh was, it was a very efficient commodity. It was used to do a whole bunch of things like embalming the dead, to all different types of things. But one of the things that myrrh was actually used for in the first century church, this is fascinating, is myrrh was actually used to be placed in some sort of a liquid, often wine, and it was given to people, watch this, as a painkiller. Remember this, they didn't have Advil, they didn't have extra tank Tylenol, they didn't have any of that. So what they did have is they would use the different things related to the environment. And myrrh mixed with wine or mixed with the liquid, when it was given to someone, it acted as a sedative, it dulled the pain. So why did Jesus refuse wine mixed with myrrh? By the way, this was customary. Anybody that was crucified in Bible times, they would actually give somebody the opportunity to receive this. Why? It was almost like a gracious act at the end of their life to give you this to, to in a sense, anesthetize the pain as you're dying publicly. He refused it. Often thought about that. Why did Jesus refuse it? I believe he refused it because he didn't want to be without his full mental and emotional faculties. In other words, he wanted to fully experience in his body, in his mind, in his emotions. He wanted to experience the judgment and the wrath of sin upon his life and the judgment of God upon his life. 
In other words, he wanted to be fully cognizant. He didn't want to be half in. He wanted to be all in. Everybody say all in. He wanted to experience the full impact of your sin and mine. Yeah. It's interesting when you understand something about myrrh. Myrrh was a bitter taste. And it's interesting when I begin to think about what bitterness, emotional bitterness does. And the connection between myrrh and the sense of the physiological dimension of how myrrh temporarily dulls the pain in the sense of that crucifixion or the different times when people would take it. But in another sense, bitterness temporarily also dulls emotional pain. You know, you're in a relationship with somebody, things don't work out the way that you thought, and you get disappointed. Here's how it works. You guys ready? Here's what, You're in a relationship, you get disappointed, then it moves. If you don't manage that right, it can move to unforgiveness where you hold them in contempt. But then if you don't deal with the unforgiveness, there's like a final step, and it goes from unforgiveness to bitterness. And when you have bitterness in your heart because of being wronged by somebody, bitterness temporarily, it actually dulls the pain. What you do is you actually drink the cup of bitterness. It kind of gives you that little jolt where it dulls the pain, but it actually imprisons the soul. Don't drink the cup of bitterness. Refuse the myrrh. Some of you guys have been in tough situations and you've been hurt, you've been neglected. You've gone through a painful Break up, something's happened, it didn't, it wasn't right. And, and, and you, listen, and you've been disappointed. By the way, Jesus said, these things are gonna happen in life, but don't let it go to unforgiveness and don't let it go to bitterness. Because when you take the cup of bitterness and you drink the cup, it gives you a temporary shot where you feel protected and anesthetized to the pain, but you don't realize you've actually imprisoned yourself. Everybody say, refuse the cup. Don't drink the bitterness. So the question then we've got to ask today is what do we learn about the words of Jesus, I'm thirsty? Three things I want to talk about today. Number one, I want to talk about the words, I'm thirsty. There's a theological reason he said that. Number two, there's a prophetic reason he said that. I'm gonna to talk to you about what does that mean, prophetic, prophecy, what does that mean? And number three, there's a personal reason for all of us. So there's a theological reason, there's a prophetic reason, and there's a personal reason. Number one, why did Jesus say, I am thirsty? Some of your Bibles say, I thirst. Why, why, why did he say that? Number one, I believe that Jesus said, I am thirsty to demonstrate theologically that Jesus really was a human being. He really was a human being. There was a heresy in the first century that said Jesus only appeared to be human. In other words, it wasn't what you thought. He, he's not real. He's God, but he only appeared to be human. I want to help everybody theologically. Jesus Christ, listen, was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. It wasn't like 50-50, mix it together, kind of a hybrid. No, he was 100% man and 100% God. Theologically, that's called the hypostatic union. Now, why is that important? Because as a man, Paul talked about this, by the way, in Philippians chapter two. Here's what Paul said. This is so important. Paul said, but he gave up, Philippians two, verse seven, but he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born as a man. He wasn't like a man. It wasn't illusion. It wasn't a holographic image. It wasn't some mirage. He was literally, physically a man. And he had needs of thirst and hunger. He's a real man, real God, but real man. He said he temporarily gave that up and, and made himself of nothing. He was born as a man and he became like a servant. And when he was living like a man, he humbled himself and, and he was fully obedient to God. Even when that caused his death, the death on the cross. Well, why is it so important? Because real humans, listen, bleed. Illusions of a man don't bleed. Real humans bleed. Jesus bleed from, bled from his side. Jesus cried out in pain. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? Okay, okay, listen. Illusions of a man don't cry out in pain. 
but real men do. Illusions of a man, they're not thirsty because they're not real beings. Jesus was a real human being. In other words, him saying, I'm thirsty, demonstrated, listen, the veracity of his humanity. He was really a man. Why is that important? Because he can really relate to us. You guys remember as kids seeing Wizard of Oz, and like, you know, you know, the guys out there, the guys behind the curtains, and there's just like this whole thing. Can, can I tell you something? Jesus, let me tell you, we don't serve a God that's Wizard of Oz. We don't serve a God that's like way far off there. He doesn't get us, and there's just some fire, and this, this thing. We actually serve a God that became one of us and understands us and can help us when we're going through the pains of life. Because can I tell you, he's been rejected. He's been alienated. He was mocked. He was scorned. He gets you you and I in our pain. How many are grateful that God knows? He knows. Some of you guys are going through some tough stuff right now. The Bible says in Hebrews, listen, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands. When you go to pray to that God, he, no, he's like, I've been there. And he also has the power to help us. So I thirst, everyone say, I thirst. He said that from the cross, number one, for a theological reason. Number two, for a prophetic reason. A prophetic reason. This is really interesting. John chapter 19, verse 28. John the apostle wrote this. He said, Jesus knew that he had now finished his work. What was his work? The work of redemption. To procure and to secure the salvation for humanity. To die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. He he knew that his work was coming to the end. And in order, here's the second thing. So he did this to accomplish his work and in order to make the scriptures come true, stop right there. What do you mean in order to make the scriptures? Don't miss this point, people. This is so important. Every location, this is so critical to what's called prophecy in the Bible. I'm not talking about prophecy and end time events. That's another dimension. I'm talking about messianic prophecies. Please stay with me. He said, in order to make the scriptures come true, he said, I am thirsty. What does the words, I am thirsty, have anything to do with the scriptures coming true? How does him saying, I am thirsty, testify and verify the veracity of the word of God? How does that relate at any level? All right, I'm going to help everybody. For those of you that are maybe new to Christianity, maybe you're just like into this, you're checking this out. Maybe you've never crossed the line of faith and and we're honored that you're here every week. We're honored wherever you're watching, whatever location you're at. This is very important. The Bible is divided in the Old Testament, the Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are over 300 what's called messianic prophecies. In other words, prophecies about the coming Messiah. Over 300. And in the Old Testament, this is so interesting, and in the Old Testament, some literally hundreds and even thousands of years before there was a literal person named Jesus on the earth. Let me give you an example. Isaiah chapter 53. This was 750 years before Christ was on the earth, before the Messiah came. This is what's called a messianic prophecy of the coming suffering servant. Listen, so this is 270,000 days 9,000 months, 750 years before, watch this, before there was a literal man, Jesus, on the earth who came to die for our sins. Listen to this. Isaiah 53, 3. This is important. I'm going to tie in the cross and the words, I am thirsty, in just a moment. Jesus said, I'm thirsty for a theological reason, but also a prophetic reason. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected by men. This is one of the 300 plus Old Testament prophecies prophecies talking about the coming Messiah. Question, was Jesus despised and rejected by men? The answer is yes. Was he a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? The answer is yes. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried away our sorrows. That's our mental and emotional anguish. I'm so grateful that Jesus not only dealt with our sins, but he can also help us in our mental and emotional pain. 
our physical pain, our emotional pain. L- listen, surely he has borne our griefs and carried away our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. That's our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's our bentness towards sin. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his what? Come on, say it. Stripes. There it is. Remember when Jesus was whipped by his stripes. So 750 years before Christ, there's a prophecy about the coming suffering servant. And it talks about the stripes on his back. That there's coming a Jewish man that's going to die for the sins of the whole world. And it happened. Then what do the words, I'm thirsty, have to do with fulfilling prophecy? I'm glad you asked. In Psalm chapter 69, verse 21, the scripture says, this is a, it's, what, it's called a messianic psalm. It's, it's a psalm that bespeaks of the coming Messiah. Remember, there's over 300 of these in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament. Watch this. And they gave me vinegar for my thirst. Here it is. All the Bible scholars are out there. They're going, wait a minute. Aha, he's getting ready to die. This one's not been fulfilled. Wait, wait, this has not been fulfilled. And literally, right before he breathes his last breath, John chapter 19, verse 29. A jar of wine, come on, what's that next word say it? Vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. So in other words, when Jesus says, I'm thirsty, it shows us two things. Number one, it shows us that he's really a man, but it also shows us that biblical prophecy, I'm not talking about end times event, I'm talking about messianic prophecies were actually fulfilled in Christ. There's over 300 in the Old Testament. This guy's coming, he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. Was Jesus born in Bethlehem, yes or no? Yes, in the book of Micah, the suffering, the, the guy's gonna come, the Messiah's gonna, he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, he's gonna be whipped. Was he whipped, yes or no? Yes. Psalm 69, he's offered vinegar to drink. Was he offered vinegar to drink on the earth, on the cross, yes or no? Yes. Matter of fact, there's over 300 of those. Over 300 of those. You know, I, I remember as a young Christian, Josh McDowell. By the way, Josh is, is still alive. Years ago, he spoke here, he's in his 80s. And I I remember reading a book, The Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it was an apologetic book, and it was defending the Christian faith. And and one of the things that Josh did and other great kind of theologians and apologists do is, 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 is proving the veracity, that's the validity of who Christ is based upon the fulfillment of Old Testament, what's called Messianic prophecies, where over 300 of these are fulfilled in Christ. There's a man, I wrote his name down, you can check this out. There's a man named Dr. Peter Stone, and he wrote a book called Science Speaks. Interesting. And part of the thesis there is he took eight, listen, he took, he did an analysis. What is the possibility of just eight, listen, eight of the over 300 prophecies, if you just took eight of those, what is the probability of eight of those being fulfilled in one man, Jesus Christ? So let me say it again. Out of all the 300 plus prophecies, if you just took eight of them, not nine, not 10, it would take the chance of all of that being fulfilled in one man just by happenstance and not by prophetic direction and not by God's sovereignty. And it did happen in Christ. Just the happenstance of that would be, watch this, one times 10 to the 28th power. Can you pull that up? Don't tell me that Jesus isn't the Messiah. Don't tell me that he didn't fulfill prophecy. Don't tell me. Just eight of them. Not nine, not 10, not nine. Let me tell you, he, he, he fulfilled prophecy because he is and was the son of God. And he really walked on the earth and he really died for your sins and mine. Man, that's powerful. Pastor, what does that have to do with me in today's world? A lot. Because you serve a God that was abused, whipped, mocked, ridiculed, rejected, abandoned by his friends. And whatever you're going through, he can relate and he can help you. 
Number one, Jesus said, I am thirsty to fulfill a theological reason, but also to fulfill a prophetic one. So let me finish with this. The third reason why I believe Jesus said, I am thirsty, is Jesus was demonstrating he was a real man who had real needs, real physical needs, real emotional needs, and he demonstrated it, watch this, publicly, publicly. He was saying, you can be real. You can be real. Because I'm demonstrating how to be real. Yeah. I often thought about why it is that we're not real and honest with people. What are the roadblocks to being real? Let me give you three. Number one is sometimes we just want to hide our weaknesses. I mean, who wants to go around telling everybody their weaknesses, and their faults and their frailties? And we all have them. I don't know anybody that doesn't have them. Anybody that doesn't admit them is not being honest. Um, I think we fear being exposed. We fear, what if people really find out, you know, what we're like? And, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we can actually be honest with what we're like because we're in process. i never forget years ago, I was doing a newcomer's uh, dinner at Church of the King, and this guy came in. He had, he, had, he had a list. He was looking for a church. He goes, he goes, good to meet you, Pastor. He goes, my wife and I here, she's, uh, we're, we're looking for a good church, strong church, healthy church. We're looking for a church with good people, strong people, quality people. Qual- we want a good group of quality people and solid people. The more he went down the list, I'm like, man, I don't even know if I fit all those qualities. I, that, that, no, you're looking for a perfect church. There's I'm sorry, sir, we don't have perfect people at church. We have imperfect people at Church of the King that love God that are in process. So you probably ought to go down the church, the street because there's that's the perfect church. We're the imperfect church, but we love God, and that's as good as we can offer. How many are grateful that God loves us in our imperfection? That, that's why Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. This is a message paraphrase, but I love to use the message sometimes. Here's what he says. We refuse to wear masks. Do you know where the development of a mask came from? This is, a little, this is not Bible trivia. This is cultural trivia. I just thought of this. But do you know where the word ma- you know where the first use and the, kind of the, the definition of the understanding of a mask came from? It actually came from Greek plays. In the Greek plays, those of you that understand the Greco-Roman culture, they would have plays and they would have public plays and, and people would go. And, 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 and an actor that wore a mask, it's the first time it's used in kind of civilization, the actor was actually called, the actor was called a hypocrite. So we've kind of, from a denotative standpoint, then connotatively speaking, where that word is migrated to the sense where now we call somebody an a hypocrite when they act one way, but then they act another way. In other words, Paul says, don't act like a hypocrite. Take your mask off and just be you. In other words, in other words, you've got to understand, we don't have to hide. We can be open. We refuse to wear masks and play games. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display. So that those who want to see, come see. You know, you know why I'm... I try to be appropriately transparent about where I am, appropriately. It's not like I go to church and like open the word, sorry guys, give me a break, I'm having a tough day. That would be gross. Give me a minute, God, I'm struggling. No, no, I try to appropriately share where I am on the other side of victory to help you know that I'm going through the same things that you're going through, but we serve a God that helps us, that God loves us, God doesn't leave us. By the way, let me say this, let me say this. We're not a perfect church, we're a healthy church. Now here's what a healthy church does. You come sick, but you do get well. And you leave healed, does that make sense? In other words, you, everybody say, come sick, leave he- healthy. In other words, so, so a good church is not a perfect church. It's whatever you come like, whoever you are, wherever you come from, you come sick. Jesus said, I came, from the, I came for the sick. But when you come, you get healed, you get strengthened, you get strong. Why? Because Jesus specializes in that. And his church helps in the process. And I'm working hard. I'm, try, I'm trying to help you understand this. 
because the enemy lies to people. And when we're doing bad, man, I, I never forget, I, I saw a guy in a restaurant years ago, so I got a restaurant. Man, where have you been? Oh, pastor, I'm not doing well. I'm like, well, so, so what does that mean? You're not doing well, so you're going to run from church? If you're not doing well, you ought to come to the house of God. You ought to run to God. In other words, you don't run away from God. You don't run away from the people. That's when you come. First John chapter 1, verse 7, for if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is, so we all are in process, but we need fellowship. Fellowship, it means we need one another. That's why you need to be in a small group. That's why you need to be around people. Again, you don't need to be transparent with thousands of people, but you need two or three or four. You got to have a huddle, a group. So why do we, why are we not real? Number one, because we want to hide our weaknesses. Number two is because we fear rejection. I mean, who wants to know, I'm going to wake up today and go, hey, it's awesome. Can't wait to be rejected. Nobody wants to be rejected. You, you guys ever seen The Voice? You know the voice, you know, the, the little person gets out there, you know, they sing, they do their thing, they do whatever, and then there's three people whose chairs are looking one way, and, the, and you're, you know, you're singing, you're doing the best you can, and you're just hoping at any moment they hit the button and turn around, and basically they say, you're accepted, we, we celebrate you. I mean, who wants to do their deal and not have anybody say, you're any good? Nobody wants to be rejected. It's kind of like this. If we did a test... A questionnaire of kind of what is your rejection prone level. One of the questions that I would say on there is, how many of you guys like getting a text? Are you like sending a text to somebody and they have the function on their phone that's not turned off? They have it still on where it says, you send a text, they read it, and there's no response. After about one minute, I'm like, I don't care about them either. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's like it kind of hurts your spirit. It's like, I, don't, I didn't want to even talk to them anyway. Nobody wants to be rejected. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody, everybody wants affirmation. By the way, political leaders do too. Preachers do. People that are before you. Just remember this. Before you send a message on Facebook criticizing somebody, that's a human being. That woman, that man, that they have emotions, they have a family, be really careful what you're about to say. Ooh, it just got heavy in church. I hope it did. I thirst. So Jesus is saying, I thirst. He understands rejection. He understands the pain of weaknesses and spirit and his body and his mind. Here's the third reason why we have a roadblock to being real. It's because the past hurts. Pastor Steve, is it possible to get past your past hurts? The answer is yes. But we've got to be willing to do what? We've got to be willing to lay something down. I tell you what, we've got to be willing to lay down. We've got to wait, lay down our identity that's been so enmeshed with our past wounds. I, I can't tell you the people that I've talked to and I've pastored and I've led and counseled over the years. And I'm like, hey, there's only one way to move into the future is you've got to lay down your past. And the way you've got to lay down your past is your identity is so fused and emerged with your past. Your past colors your present, and it also is about to color your future. I know it was wrong what happened to you. I know it was painful. John, or James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We are forgiven by God, but healing comes through relationships in the body of Christ. By the way, how did you get hurt? The devil stirred somebody up and they hurt you. How do you get healed? God stirs somebody up and God uses people in the healing process. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. There's a lot of forgiven Christians that are not healed. Whenever I hear anybody, I've been doing this a long time, by the way. Whenever I hear anybody, oh, I don't go to church, I just, it's just me and Jesus. That's a person who's a Christian that got hurt in relationships, and I understand it was painful, and they just thought, I'm gonna wall off, and I'm gonna do Jesus and Christianity by myself. And, and I'm not suggesting you can't go to heaven, but you won't experience the fullness of God for you without the body of Christ. I'm just going to go to the coffee shop and read the book of Revelations by myself. You can do that. You need to study the book of Revelation. I teach you the book of Revelation. But if you do that isolated from other people, you're going to think you're actually part of the book of Revelation. Then you're going to think you're actually John who wrote the book. You're going to get weird. That was funny. I don't care if you laughed or not. That was funny. 
Isolated Christians get weird and picked off by the devil. Let me say that to every location. Isolated Christians get weird and picked off by the devil. But Christians that are with one another and they're connected in the body of Christ. And I know it's been hurtful. And I know it hurt. And I know it was wrong. But you got to forgive. Everybody say forgive. And you got to trust again. So why do we have roadblocks to being real sometimes? Because we just don't want to, we don't want anybody to see our weaknesses. That's why I love Church of the King. I love our small group leaders. I love this house that you can come sick, you can come broken. And this is a place to get healed and restored and raised back up. But our hidden weaknesses, our fear of rejection, our past hurts, thank God for the body of Christ. Colossians 2.19, it is from him that all parts grow of the body and are cared for and held together. I need the body of Christ. You need the body of Christ. We need one another. So it grows in the way God wants it to grow. I thank God I am where I am today. I've not quit many times because of men around me that have loved me and cared for me. How many of y'all grateful for the body of Christ? Come on, how many of y'all grateful? Man, I'm grateful for the body of Christ. Maybe you're not in a small group. If you just text the word connect, just text it, the word connect, 822-822. Let them know as information comes. Do you want to get connected in a small group? We have lots of them all around our campuses. We have online groups. So I'll close with this. Where are you with God? I thirst. It's a theological reason. He was fully God, but he was also fully a man. And Jesus was dying on the cross for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. Can you do that all across our locations those that are joining us online, in just a moment, I want to let you, you need to let the host know, the online host know what Christ is doing in your life. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're not ready to stand before God. I want to pray for you. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't change first and then come to God. You simply come to Christ. You open your heart to Jesus. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me and make me new. Do you know Jesus? Do you know that you know if you die today, you're ready to stand before God? In just a moment, every one of our locations at the count of three say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me. I'm not at peace with God. I want to surrender my heart to Christ. If that's you at the count of three, I want you just to lift your hand up high. Pastor, pray for me. If that's you, one, two, three, quickly hold your hand up high. So God bless you right there. God bless you and you as well. God bless you up top. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you way up top, sir. God bless you right there. Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure about my Rick. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. God bless you up top as well. God bless you. Church, can we pray with those that are trusting Christ? This is a very important moment each week in our service. Come on, let's all pray together as the body of Christ. Come on, can we pray with them? Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say this, say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this, say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. From this day forward, I belong to you. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Wow, what an amazing message. And we wanna take just a minute right now to acknowledge those of you who, after hearing about being vulnerable, maybe in this moment right now, you are admitting your need for a savior. Maybe you're making the decision right now to give your life to Jesus for the very first time. We just wanna say, congratulations. This is a big deal. This is the best decision you could ever make. And we want you to know, that scripture is clear. You are not just a better version of yourself. You're not just gonna hopefully be better. No, the Bible says you are a brand new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Your regret, your sin, your shame is no more. You are brand new. And we are so excited as you begin this new journey. Yes, this is an incredible new journey with Christ. And we want to do this journey alongside of you. So you can click the link on your screen or in the chat room. And we would love to walk alongside of you in this new decision for Christ. Well, guys, that's all of our time for this week. But come back next week as we continue our series, How to Live Through a Bad Day. The series has been amazing so far, and we can't wait to continue it with you next week. Same time. Same place. See you soon.